So obviously, one of the great problems for those uh, suffering from extreme poverty is hunger. And one of the videos uh, I'd like you to look at now from the Social Good Summit uh, deals with a project at eradicating hunger um, and uh, through some creative, uh, creative uses of technology and uh, social energy. We'll have a look at that. We're going to shift into to talking about an issue that's really you know, impacting all kinds of places around the world, and that's hunger. And we're going to get started with this next conversation, which is entitled Hashtag Zero Hunger Challenge, Small Act, Big Impact. It's going to be moderated, again, by uh, a, a Mashable. Uh, and it's Lauren Drell from Mashable, and she's going to be joined on stage by Lauren Bush Lauren, the founder and CEO of Feed Products, Gary Flood, president of Global Products and Solutions for MasterCard Worldwide, and Earthrin Cousin, the executive director of the World Food Program. Let's welcome them to the Social Good Summit stage. Hi, so I'm Lauren Drell. I'm the branded content editor at Mashable, and we're here to discuss a very important issue, which is hunger. Uh, a lot of us in this room probably have a dollar twenty-five in loose change in our pockets, or if you're like me, at the bottom of your purse. Uh, but in much of the world, that's all people have to live on every single day. So these three people are doing tremendous things to help fight hunger uh, worldwide. So uh, let's cut right to it. Um, so Earthrin, tell us a little bit about what the World Food Program is doing today. Well, the World Food Program is the largest humanitarian organization working to feed people around the entire global community. Last year, we fed almost uh, 99 million people in 88 countries around the world. <clears throat> And we are able to provide that support because of the generosity of people like those sitting in this room because the World Food Program is a hundred percent voluntarily funded and we raise our money every year in order to meet the needs of those we serve. So uh, if you're going to end hunger by 2030 as part of the Zero Hunger Challenge, you're going to have to be innovative. So what are, how are you leveraging digital and social tools to get the mission done? Well, the reality of it is we've been in business for 50 years. And if we keep doing things the way we've always done them, we're not going to achieve the Zero Hunger Challenge. What it requires is that we not only feed stomachs, which we've been known for, but also that we begin to build resilience of those who that we serve, that, and we create sustainable tools that will allow families to feed their own children. And we can't do that without innovation. And that innovation comes in many different forms. One of them is our new digital money, where we provide, instead of commodities, we provide cash through our partner, MasterCard here, who helps us ensure that where there's food available in the market, that those who we serve can access and choose their own food, as we do, as those of us who have access to capital do on a regular basis. But for them, it's a luxury when you live on a dollar twenty-five cents a day to actually decide what your family's going to eat. And innovative tools now allow us to do that. Communication allows us to continue to build the public will that is necessary to ensure that we can raise what is now four billion dollars necessary to reach those who are in need. Uh, working with partners like Lauren Bush Lauren, who's here with us today as well, who works on the feedbacks. I'm going to let her tell you about that. But the reality of it is it's those kind of new innovative partners. But I'd be remiss, if while I still have my 30 seconds, if I didn't also say here in the United States, we have a great partner, WFP USA, and Hunter Biden, who is the chair of WFP USA, who helps us raise money. They raise money for WFP here in the States. We couldn't do it without them. And he's off, and I'll, everybody say a prayer for Hunter. He has stomach flu uh, and couldn't be here today. And he would have joined us on the stage and told us about the innovative work that they're doing here in the United States. But it's a team effort. WFP doesn't do this work alone. We have great partners who ensure that the innovation is not just a word, but a reality that makes a difference in the lives of the people we serve. Okay. 
So, Lauren, you're obviously part of that team. Um, so, and you're very familiar with the World Food Program. You've been working with them since 2004. Um, so tell us how Feed is helping to fight hunger. So, yeah, Feed um, was an idea I had after being able to travel um, as a student with the World Food Program, um, learning about, you know, the issue of hunger and poverty. 870 million people around the world are food insecure, which is shocking and overwhelming. Yet you go and you travel, as Earthrin has done, obviously, um, countless times, and you, you meet these families and kids, and just because where they're born, they're born into a life of, you know, chronic hunger and malnutrition, and it's just so unfair. Um, and I thought, you know, if you can break it down, though, into a meal, into um, a school meal, especially because it's encouraging kids to go to school and get an education as well as receive this nutritious meal a day, it's so brilliant, and anyone and everyone, especially young people, would want to get behind this. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I love design and you know, the fashion industry, and created the first feed bag as a way for people to give back in this tangible and measurable way um, to, you know, what can be a very overwhelming and massive problem of world hunger. So every feed bag we have has a number on it, which signifies the amount of meals you're, you're donating, essentially, or children you're helping through that purchase. So it's a really easy, tangible, quick, fun, fashionable way uh, for people to help in the fight to end world hunger. So you work in the space of sort of conscious commerce, uh, mm -hmm. and you've worked with a lot of big brands like Target and Gap and Whole Foods. How do you leverage these partnerships? How effective are they? Partnerships are essential. So in growing, you know, what is essentially a, a, a brand and a consumer goods company, to partner with the bigger players out there, the Targets of the world, um, the Pottery Barns, Gap, Disney, Clarins, Godiva, the list goes on and on, and do really fun, innovative, strategic partnerships um, that really, you know, speak to their customers and the, the people that they want to reach, too, only has built and expanded upon our brand and thus expanded our giving. So it's been, a, you know, a fun part of what I get to do um, is to come up with these partnerships and uh, figure out the best way to work together, but ultimately for the, the greater good of donating to the World Food Program or UNICEF or other partners on the ground. Okay. Um, so, Gary, you're also on this consumer-facing uh, side of, of fighting hunger. Um, so how are you engaging consumers uh, through everyday purchases to stop hunger? Yeah, I think um, you're 50 years old. MasterCard's about 50 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at MasterCard probably half my life. It feels that way. <laughs> um, thinking about consumers and what matters to them is kind of at the foundation of what we do, as is innovation. You know, as you guys talked about innovation, I mean, what we've experienced is the openness and transparency of understanding each other's kind of challenges and opportunities, and then what technology actually provides really can provide wonderful space to do new and different things. Uh, for us, I mean, we have about uh, 2 billion devices around the world, maybe 1.6 billion consumers. So when we think about our consumer universe, particularly as we work with the uh, World Food Program, it's about enabling and motivating that universe of folks to contribute. You know, we've done a lot of research. We did work over in Europe where we contributed, uh, I think, a little over 2 million school meals uh, over a several months uh, period. And when you talk to everybody who participated, the consumer side, the merchant side, the bank side, everybody loved the idea. They loved the concept, and they felt really, really good about it. All right. So, one, the innovation has got to be open and transparent. And, two, you, gotta, you have to be able to provide consumers with a way to actually participate easily. Uh, we're actually down a path now where we're going to be launching an integrated gift-giving platform a little bit later this year. Consumers will be able to go online and actually put in their parameters of how much they want to give each time they spend or how much they want to give each time they spend and then cap it at a month or a year or every six months. So they're going to have control over their giving. Um, generally, they're very motivated to participate. So if we can make it easy by them conducting everyday purchases daily and then help them understand that it doesn't take much to feed somebody. Mm -hmm. All right? and, their, and their contribution does make a difference. So that's kind of where we're concentrating right now. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the digital food and the electronic vouchers that you're working on? I love uh, digitizing food. I think that, that those two words were kind of cool when they came out. I didn't create them. The smarter folks did. But the concept of enabling somebody to purchase food locally from a merchant, all right, so that they can buy what they need when they need it, is very empowering. So, you know, you can take a step back and say it's about transactions. It's about uh, conducting commerce. It's actually about empowerment and inclusion. Um, you know, as we think about our franchise, there's so many folks that need to be included and to participate in a way that enables life to be easier. So this is one great demonstration of that. 
I'm curious, I mean, how do you, hunger is such a global issue, obviously, how do you make sure that it stays on our radar, both as, um, as individuals, like all of us in this room, but also on the radars of governments and, and uh, political groups? Well, the reality of it is social media has helped us in a tremendous, in a tremendous way. Uh, having the ability to tweet, I scare my, frighten my team on a regular basis because I, I tweet myself. Uh, By the way, through the my hashtag Blackberry. is Zero Hunger Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so having the ability to tweet from Sinai when you're standing with a mother and a child and you can actually tell their story mm -hmm. firsthand um, begins to build an awareness that otherwise the average consumer, the average individual couldn't, couldn't access. Mm -hmm. uh, having the ability to to use the, the media to help us tell stories. Um, the media has been very, very generous in writing the stories of not just babies who are starving, but families whose lives are being changed by school feeding programs because they do have a different opportunity, a different set of opportunities than they would have but for these programs. And so it's only when we can make this personal for people, give them the information that they say, I want to make a difference, or I want my government to make a difference, or I appreciate that my government is investing. And that becomes part of our responsibility to tell those stories on a regular basis. And so we will continue to tell the story, but what we need is to have you retweet them and to friend us and to, and to share the messages that you receive from us because it's only if we as an entire global community embrace the opportunity to make a difference that we will. The social lab definitely eliminates the difference, the distance rather, between us and the issues that are being faced around exactly. the world. Brings it a little bit closer to home. Um, so obviously for feed, buying a bag literally helps put food in, uh, in someone's mouths. But have you found that buying the bag actually drives consumer awareness of this issue? It is, yeah. I would say half the value of feed is the awareness we're able to raise and sort of the activation we're able to give people around the issue of hunger. Um, you know, we've been able to donate nearly 60 million school meals. So we're so proud of that. But um, I think equally as proud when I see someone walking down the street with a feed bag who, you know, knows about hunger now and knows about feed and hopefully has read the kind of lengthy hang tag we include, which has some of the top line facts, and then maybe even dug a bit deeper and visited the World Food Program's website or um, the Feed Foundation's website. So I do hope feed is kind of a conduit or entry point for people to get involved with the issue. Mm -hmm. Definitely a conversation starter. Yeah. Yeah, sort of lure people in. Um, okay, great. So I think we're uh, just about ready to wrap up. I do want to mention that um, on World Food Day, which is October 16th, uh, the World Food Pro Program is partnering with Michael Kors for an awareness raising campaign that will live both online and offline. Uh, the hashtag will be Watch Hunger Stop, and there are going to be some really neat activations uh, using GIFs uh, at some Michael, Michael Kors shops uh, worldwide. So definitely stay tuned to that, October 16th. Uh, World Food Day. Thank you so much for being here and for doing such impactful work. It's obviously a very important issue. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you. So we need, we need all kinds of economic growth. Uh, some of it will be spurred by the government. Some of it will be uh, instigated by outside agencies. And, uh, and some just by private initiative. Uh, I say that because some people ideologically say, well, we need the government to step in and do these things. Other people ideologically say, no, no, the government, if it does it, is wrong. Uh, uh, you know, we have to only have private enterprise. I, I, I'm hoping, I hope that I'm approaching this uh, more empirically. That is, um, we need all of these things, and it's an empirical question what kinds of stimulus work best or stimuli work best in which context. And, and it, it's not just an ideological question, like it's the government's responsibility, or governments are bad, or um, some mixture of those things. What we need to know is what works in which contexts to create economic growth. We do know that economic growth is necessary, but what we need to know is what works best in which context. Growth means jobs. We need to create jobs for young people, 
and we need to create jobs for women. This is very important, and, and, and important because for a long time it was left out of development plans. Uh, that a development uh, it will be more successful when it's more inclusive, when you include a greater percentage of the population. Um, and uh, um, let, let me just quote Jeffrey Sachs, who we'll be talking to uh, and, and listening to in, in, in this week. Uh, Sachs says, the main problem is not the absence of reasonable and low-cost solutions, but the difficulty of implementing global cooperation to put those solutions in place. Now, Jeffrey Sachs thinks he knows which solutions will work best, but we have to have our more, we have to have better cooperation. Governments have to be less self-interested, less politically motivated. Um, and, and, and then if we have the proper resources and cooperation, we can get the job done. There are others, as we'll see, who are less uh, sure that we know the right solution for every problem um, and are, are more experimentally oriented, perhaps, than Professor Sachs. But the, the, the key is, I think, to take away from this is that um, we, we do know that inclusive economic development is important, um, and what we have to find out is what works in which contexts. Uh, what works uh, for rice growers in India might be quite different from what, 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 what works for uh, uh, people who uh, have livestock in Africa or uh, 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 people who are, are dealing with extreme poverty in urban areas. They may have the cultural factors, the specific market factors and economic factors may be very different. What we need are small steps to deal with these big problems. We might say there are four hurdles to economic uh, development. Um, and first, there, there must be uh, an adequate uh, domestic savings, a adequate domestic savings. It's so one of that people have to have some mechanism for accumulating some capital that they could deploy for growth and not just um, have things that they need to consume right away. So some savings that can be then put to work for the creation of economic development. Um, an export sector is important uh, for economic development, uh, and Sachs has argued, uh, and many ha uh, agree, uh, because you have to have a place to go with what you've made with your um, accumulated capital. You have to have some place to go, some market to get to, um, uh, so that you can trade and create a virtuous cycle of economic activity. At a larger scale, uh, uh, a, a viable government, a strong government that has some financial capacity, um, is necessary for a region's economic development. We have seen time and time again governmental corruption or ineptitude uh, gets in the way um, of, of uh, economic development, uh, and, and a government can uh, facilitate the tr moving past the, uh, the, the next hurdle, which is to adapt technology to local needs and uh, local uh, requirements. Uh, governments are in a particularly good place um, to understand how to take sci scientific uh, 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 developments, how to take technology, and connect that to uh, the needed infrastructure. Now, there will be some argument about that among developmental eco uh, development economists. Some will, will, will think that government is, is often the worst place to go for this assistance, that private enterprise will be more important. Uh, we, but we can see that um, in order to take the domestic savings and get it to a market, um, you need an infrastructure and a stable financial envelope for these developments to take place so that a region, not just individuals, so a region can begin to experience the benefits of sustained economic development. Now, Sachs talks about uh, four stages of development, subsistence, commercial, the emerging market, and technology-based. In each of those stages, you, as you move from one stage to the next, you get a higher level of capital per person. So that in each of, as you move from one stage to the next, you will have people with more um, uh, ac accumulated wealth that they can deploy for um, continued development. In the subsistence level, it really might be that you have um, a fertilizer that you can use to increase your crop yield beyond what you need immediately to con consume uh, that you can then 
trade um, to create, get more fertilizer, to create an even larger crop that you can trade more of, that you have enough to meet your own needs, that you become not just a subsistence farmer but a commercial farmer, a farmer that is um, um, uh, accumulating capital while also feeding other people um, and, and building a commercial sector. As you move through the stages, and this is where Sachs's optimism comes from, I think, is that you get – um, uh, 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 the, the benefits of, of, of knowledge, you get the benefits of, of, of technology um, that would help um, move people through stages of development um, uh, more efficiently. Uh, you need a multi-pronged effort to have this kind of economic growth. It's, there is not one, um, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. Uh, a, a sound development strategy has to pay attention to geography. Uh, it has to pay attention to um, uh, the, the, the relationship of the rural and the urban environments. And it also has to very much um, take into account the, the creation of an infrastructure that allows for successful communication and trade. Um, I, I, it's important to understand that, that um, the creation of viable transportation and communication networks uh, make economic development much more likely to occur. Uh, you, the, uh, the hurdle of not having decent roads or bri bridges, uh, the hurdle of not having decent communication um, it has been one of the most important uh, uh, barriers to economic development. And one of the reasons some people are so optimistic about our efforts in this regard is because communication devices are much more readily available, even in the developing world today, than they were uh, a few decades ago, even a decade ago. Um, and that mobile technology and other technologies uh, uh, are becoming ubiquitous, even in the developing world, and that these can be tools for facilitating market exchanges, which will get people on this ladder of economic growth. Uh, because market exchanges and the exchange of information is so important for people to move out of the subsistence condition and into the condition where of, of commerce, of, of trade that creates growth. Um, uh, again, I want to go back to Jim Kim's point that uh, – Economic growth that is not inclusive is, is fundamentally unstable. That is, so it, this process has to include sectors of the population that had, by tradition, uh, often been left out, especially uh, women and, and young people. It's important for us to note that 70%, 70% of the world's poor are women. And so development plans that don't target women uh, uh, are bound to, to fail. Inclusion is not just uh, an ethical or political uh, 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 value that we bring to this. Uh, inclusion uh, makes economic sense uh, because it's only when the poorest of the poor are included that we will have sustained economic growth. We don't want economic growth, let's say, measured nationally that really is about the top 2% getting richer and richer and richer um, and that hope that will trickle down. Uh, we have not seen that that leads to sustainable growth. Um, we have seen that um, um, incentives for uh, including women, uh, young people, and the poorest of the poor um, uh, reduce drags on the uh, economy, a uh, national economy, and allow for much more sustained uh, uh, economic growth, um, uh, which will produce some inequality. I don't want to make this sound as if uh, um, some, there won't be winners and losers. There will be winners and losers, but the losers won't be a, the law, losers in an economic transaction won't be a death sentence. Um, it becomes um, a, a part of an ongoing cycle of uh, economic uh, conditions.